Thank you. 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 Yeah, that's Don, probably good. Do you want to say a little bit about this before no. you before you start? Or you yes, start? I will. And uh, any questions during this talk, go ahead and ask me because if you have to wait till the end of the show, then we'll probably forget what we <laughs> what you wanted to ask, and I'd forget the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I I gave a similar talk uh, last fall at the annual meeting of the Ottaquichi section of the Green Mountain Club. Oh. And it was started in 1825, and since then, I uh, asked Google if they knew anything about the Mount of Scutney. And sure enough, they came up with some information about somebody measuring the altitude of Mount of Scutney in 1817. So that's where we'll start. Did I hit the right button? Yeah. And we thank Rick for it. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's this one right here. Though. Okay, that yeah. <laughs> Is that the next slide or yeah. did I skip one? Yeah. Yeah, this man who was a captain of the uh, so-called engineers, and uh, it might have been in the, the early days of the geodetic survey people, he was on, evidently based in Governor's Island, Massachusetts, and he was on vacation, so he came up here and measured the the height of uh, Mount of Scutney, and he came out with 3,320 3, feet. Uh, actually, now we, we find that the, uh, the elevation is 3,144, so it wasn't too far off. The other interesting thing is he also <coughs> went up Mount Musilock, and they called it Mount Moose Hillock then, because there were a lot of moose around that area. And I thought maybe Somebody told him that the mountain was called uh, Mount Musilock, and he understood it as Moose Hillock. But that's not the story. Actually, later on, they changed the name to Musilock, which is the Indian word for Bear Hill, or the bare top of the mountain. <clears throat> In 1825, uh, yeah, this, that, sh that went one b Okay. Yeah, Lafayette, uh, of course, was a famous general, helped us win the Revolutionary War. He, being a Frenchman, was always glad to come over and fight the English. <laughs> so, uh, after the, <coughs> of course, the Revolution was <coughs> back a good many years from that, but he came over here in 1825 and visited all of the states in the Union at that time. There were 24 states. Actually, he came over in 1824. And the, the last state he visited was Vermont. And at that time, he was, he was uh, 68 years old. Look at that. Google did a good job at restoring all the creases out of there. Right. <laughs> now, this didn't come from Google. Uh, no, I know. I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> There's a book uh, this, on the right side, the book, Lafayette in Vermont was written by Mary Grace Canfield, who lived in Woodstock. That was written in 1934. And I have a, a copy of it in the folder back here. And she wrote a very complete book of Lafayette's uh, really fast visit here in Vermont. But she, she must have dug into all the old records, newspapers, and so on to find out just the time <laughs> the times when he was here and the people that uh, he visited and, and the people that uh, made speeches at his visits and all that. And the travel here in New England, uh, of course most of it was overland and uh, this was the type of uh, buggy 
a vehicle that they rode in. It's called the Baruch. And uh, he and his son and his secretary and his servant, there were four in the party, and they did all their traveling overland in a vehicle like this. And but I guess here in Vermont they used four horses instead of two because they uh, were on a full gallop most of the time. <laughs> he, wrote, he got here at 7 o'clock in the morning in Windsor, he, coming over from Claremont. He'd spent the night before in Claremont. And he was a day late, so that uh, people that came up here to Windsor to see him the day before, I guess, either had to go home or camp out somewhere. <laughs> and so he got here 7 o'clock in the morning at Windsor, came across the toll bridge from across the river, and uh, <clears throat> and so they had big, big celebration for him here in Windsor, starting at 7 o'clock. And then estimated three, three or four thousand people came to greet him. They must have come from all over. The interesting thing was that the, they had a band from Springfield that uh, provided the music. And they ate at Pete's Coffee House, or Petey's. Uh, <laughs> Petty's, yeah. I guess it was right up. Yeah. At 9.30 that same morning, they, they left for Woodstock uh, after spending only an hour and a half here in Windsor and going up through Heartland and I guess probably the old, what we call the Skunk Hollow Road, they arrived in Woodstock at 11. Now that's pretty good time. <laughs> I don't know just how many miles that is, but at 10 miles an hour they could have gone 15 miles in that time. Again, a large crowd, speeches, and, and a lunch there at Woodstock. And the, so they left Woodstock uh, in the early afternoon. Yeah, if he got there at 11 and they only spent an hour and a half in Woodstock, so he, he was out of Woodstock about 12.30. And they went up through to uh, Barrie first and then to uh, Montpelier, where he spent the night. And of course, again, they had a big dinner for him and all dignitaries and all that. Uh, next morning, went to Burlington, and again, large crowds, and spent the time of day to, <coughs> spent time to lay a cornerstone in one of the UVM buildings, which I guess you can still see. After a big dinner was held there in Burlington, uh, and another dinner later in the evening, <laughs> and at 11 o'clock, he boarded a steamboat named the Phoenix, which took him to Whitehall, and then from there he traveled to New York and back to France. Uh, he only stayed two days in Vermont, one night, uh, two days and one night. Uh, last fall, I happened to run into a, a little documentary about uh, Lafayette's uh, trip here in, in the States, because he actually came over in, in uh, 1824, and he, when he landed in, in New York City, or New York, they said there was a population of about 80,000 in New York at that time, and uh, 60,000 of them came out to the dock to welcome him when he when his ship landed in New, York, in New York. Okay, now we jump forward to 1841. Uh, this was the, <coughs> I based this talk on what I could find written, ri written words about Mount Escutney. In 1841, well, I should backtrack a little bit. Uh, they had made a, a road, some kind of a road up Mount Escutney because they were going to take him up there in a buggy so he could uh, get to a real high point here in the Green Mountains and be able to look around. But being a day late, they didn't have time to uh, try to take him up the mountain. Uh, they don't really, in the history I've read, they don't really know how much of a road they got built for, to go up the mountain 
But they do know, we do know later on, the horse and buggy could make the trip. But <coughs> being that road was uh, opened up uh, more, or that trail been opened up more than it had been before, probably it got hiked on quite a bit. And <coughs> so I ran into a, a little story by this man, Hornus de Stearns, who was a school teacher down the base of the mountain. In 1841, he uh, climbed the mountain. He said it was uh, quite easy climbing. It was in the winter, but the snow, we didn't have a lot of snow that winter. It was in February. The snow had crusted down, so it was easy walking. He went up to the top and got great views looking all around. And uh, then when he came down, he said he <coughs> got a piece of big piece of bark off a tree and slid some of the way. He must have come pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, by the way, uh, Honest de Stearns is an ancestor of a man who lives in Springfield, who's quite a historian, uh, Hugh Putnam. And also, Hugh Putnam was the one that got that uh, copy of that book of uh, Lafayette's uh, travels here in Vermont. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, got, I probably held that down to a. Yeah, in uh, 1857, 58, they surveyed, D.C. Lindsay surveyed the, the road up the mountain, and that was probably the first actual survey so that they would know where the, where the road was or the trail was. And uh, then they built, that's when they built the original stone hut, which they called the Summit House. And you can see that was quite a job because it was 14 by 20, all made out of cut stones. And, and the stones that you can see now around the, the old foundation up there, you can see where they drilled in and cut like, like uh, quarry people do. And I assume they took all those stones that, or granite stones from the top of the mountain. I don't think they hauled them up there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've always wondered. They must have just... What was Probably the... if you looked around and really dug down and into the... <coughs> and took some of the debris off rocks around there, you'd probably find where they cut stones out of the local rocks. Okay, and they, after they got that the hut built, of course, they were all pretty happy about it. And they had a big celebration, and uh, and some, I figure about 300 people attended. Uh, they thought there would have been there would have been more, but uh, they had a heavy rainstorm the night before, and that probably de deterred some people from uh, making the trip. And they had speeches, they had a lunch. I say dinner, but probably it was more like a lunch. And the Windsor. Cornette band furnished the music. <laughs> and uh, I think they said the oldest man that uh, made that hike was 80 years old. Th this is the only picture that we could, I f could find of the summit house before it was destroyed or vandals pushed it down. What is the roof material? Well, it looks just like some, you can see some small logs going this way, and underneath, I don't know what that is. Uh, Could it be corrugated sheet metal? Or? Well, I don't know whether they had corrugated in 1858. <laughs> they might have. Uh, later, they did use metal, but it wasn't corrugated. I wonder if I... Yeah, okay. Okay, in 1883, they had this big fire on the top of the mountain, and they say it burned most all summer, and it, it made it difficult to use the trail because of all the dead trees, the fallen trees. And uh, sometime in that period, the uh, summit house was pushed over and just destroyed or dismantled by vandals. Uh, 
I, I would su suspect that maybe after the fire, the roof was pretty much burned down, and that made it easier for anybody to go up and push the walls in. <laughs> and there were no trees on the top of the mountain. I always wondered when, the, when I saw the pictures of the big, uh, big crowd that was on top of the mountain in 19, in 1904, uh, whether they all had to go up the old Windsor Trail or that old road. And uh, actually they had three other trails, one on the Brownsville side that joined the Lindsay Road near the top. Uh, another was the old Wood Road, an old Wood Road on the Wethersfield side that say, they say went nearly to the top. And another from Scottneyville, which went over an area called Blueberry Ridge. And I don't know if anybody ever remembers. Tom, this, this road that they, you know, that they travel on and survey, is that what we now have as the Order Route? Yes, yeah, so the, the Windsor Trail is, um, the present Windsor Trail is pretty much on where the old road was made. It, there were some changes. It's not where the road is now. No, not where the, the auto road, no. Oh, okay. no. So in 1903, we can see that a horse and buggy made it up there. <laughs> Must have been kind of a jolting ride. But now you can see all of the stones that were, had been cut and, and used to build the original summit house. Fortunately, in 1903 or 19, 19, 4, they uh, rebuilt the Summit House. This is going just a little bit ahead of time. This is where I got most of this in, the information about the early days of the uh, Scutney Mountain Association. And this is the uh, guidebook that they published in 1905. And there's a copy of it there on the on the uh, board, on the table. That was in the original scrapbooks that uh, Herb Ogden kept. And of course, it's just a little small book, about three by five, and it was glued into the scrapbook. And I'd, uh, I'd peeked at it a few times, but it was kind of hard to read it. So last year, I, I scanned it into the computer and, and blew it up in uh, eight and a half by 11 size. So you can read it easily in that folder. There's some of the pictures. This was after the, the hut was rebuilt in 1903 and 4, I guess. Shows that the hut had a flagpole. And then over to the right, there was this funny looking wooden tower. And we always wondered what the heck it was for. And uh, they didn't have telecommunications. No, and didn't have cell phones or any of that no. stuff. <laughs> but I'll tell you what they used it for. Okay, after they got the hut rebuilt, and you can see it's pretty nice shape now, and I think that is metal yeah. uh, roofing. And uh, they had a stove in there with a the chimney. And so they had a big celebration on the after the, in dedication, after the hut was rebuilt. And I guess they had it in uh, September, Labor Day weekend. They only had 700 people <laughs> that came. And they had the brass bit of band from Windsor, the yeah, Windsor military. military band. And notice, you didn't see any, anybody in, in uh, sport clothes. The men all had their suits and ties. The women had their nice uh, uh, dresses. And this next picture, I think you'll see that a lot of the women had their big hats. <laughs> uh, evidently, you can see there's some numbers on some of these people. Of course, this was a copy of, a, of this picture that we have. And uh, evidently, somebody, uh, if you had the right caption, could tell you who who those numbered people are. There's a man over to the, in the right side, sort of on the other right side, I won't point him out, but he was from, his name was Bob Williams, and he was from Springfield, and he was quite an outdoors guy. And the, uh, 
what what I read about uh, in that guidebook about this this event that he and his friend made it up the mountain on on that uh, Windsor so-called Windsor Trail uh, in uh, 110 minutes. So that was pretty good time. Well, we don't know. I, I assume that maybe some rode up on horseback. We don't see any horses standing around waiting, but of course there wasn't any room for them. And you see, at that time there were no trees on the top of the mountain. You couldn't do this today. <laughs> and that was quite a feat to, uh, for the photographer to be able to set up and get everybody in the picture. And these old glass slides, you know, being large like that, you get very good reproduction because you got to remember this. This was a picture made from, from originally from the glass slide, and then printed, and then I had to scan it in on the computer. And you still got pretty good uh, resolution. Well, I think the reason there's not any trees because that 1983 80, fire just took all the trees off the top of the mountain. But they would build a bonfire so yeah. people know that right. they were on top. <laughs> Evidently, no, back then there weren't so many distractions, you know, something like this hike. A lot of people would attend. Of course, today you've got television and all kinds of other things that people are doing, so we don't get crowds that large anymore. Yeah, there's some pretty good climbers to climb up that skeleton of a, of a, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, in the, in that, in the guidebook, they, they tell us what this, who built this tower. It was built by the U.S. Geodetic Survey, 1904. And we still wondered what the heck they did with it. So I talked to uh, Bill Drood, who was, a, who was a surveyor in Springfield. He's no longer with us. But uh, he told me that these towers were built and they would hang a lantern up on the top. And then from other high points around, like say the top of Akemo and maybe Sam's Hill over in Charlestown, <coughs> they, would, they would sight there survey instruments on that on these lanterns and that's how they got a better idea of just where Mount Escutney is because probably they'd run this system starting maybe down in on the coast in Boston or somewhere where they they knew the actual location and then uh, by trying triangulation uh, from these mountaintop lanterns or lights they could get a better fix on where where we really are. <laughs> we don't know how long that uh, steeple or that tower was left there. I, I assume that the geodetic survey people wouldn't leave it there forever because it would be kind of a hazard and uh, these guys are pretty good climbers to get up it. John, did they then put a, a bronze marker in the rock? Yeah. A permanent record? Yeah, probably somebody remembers the, there's two bronze mar markers there. Oh, there is one, right? Yeah. Three, yeah. Yeah, there's a date on them. I should know what the date is. I think maybe it was later. Because that, because the bronze marker, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you the bearing, does it? It just tells you the, the altitude. Yeah. But it may have a serial number. So yeah, you can could go be. To a map and yeah. find the bearing. Okay, I, I've, I've just been handed some stuff about the geodetic survey. <laughs> so what is the fire tower? Okay, George has got the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, I'll have to put my glasses on <laughs> so I can read it. George, were you climbing up there? <laughs> no, the bronze marker on the top says U.S. Coast 
in Geodetic Survey, reference mark, Scutney, 1873, number two, and there's a, a arrow. I suppose that arrow points north, doesn't it? Yeah. And then under it says 1971. And I write to the director, Washington, D.C., for information. $250 fine if you disturb this mark. And uh, the number one and number two, yeah. Yeah, thanks, George. That, that answers the question. So after this uh, was done, at least we knew somewhere near what the altitude of the mountain was and, and uh, the pretty accurate location. Here's another picture was taken. It's kind of hard to, to say uh, just where that was taken, but it was be north of the shelter and you can see the base of that uh, tower. I assume they got all those timbers locally. <laughs> of course, having the uh, shelter there, having the, the hut there was a big help to the geodetic survey people because they had a place they, because when they're hanging lanterns on the, these towers, they had to do it at night and just give them, gave them a good place they could go up and spend all night if they wanted. This was a little after 1904. <laughs> People that uh, rode horseback up the mountain, kids climbed on top of the roof. <laughs> and now we're going to the Norcross Quarry, which started, I believe, around 1911 19, or 12, sometime in that era. Uh, there's some other shots and I think the uh, part of that railroad track is still there and uh, of course it's one of the beams or some of the beams from the the big uh, derricks are there. I think this ran until about eight, uh, 1923 and uh, yeah some of the uh, rock quarried out of here uh, was used to, for the face of the Bank of Montreal, and I assume it's still there. I, I, I saw it quite a few years ago at Mon in Montreal. Also a building at, uh, in New York and, uh, and one in uh, Ohio. What sort of stone is that? It's granite, but one problem they had is quite a little iron in this granite, and then after it's been used as a uh, a stone for a facing of a building or whatever. It uh, turns green or it has green streaks. And so that may, meant that this... Uh, it's more like copper rather than iron. Iron would yeah. turn rusty and run. Yeah. Well, they said, they said iron. <laughs> maybe, it, really? maybe it's but not green. green. If it turns green, it's got to be Did they say yeah. green? Because I've seen lots of uh, rusty colored. Yeah, I guess, it w I guess probably it is rusty colored. I don't know where I got the idea of green. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, one of the buildings at Columbia University used this uh, granite. The library at Columbia University. Yeah. Well, that's under the basketball thing. Uh, also, they said when <coughs> cause they carried this uh, blocks of granite down that steep road, you know, that makes, makes up part of the Brownsville Trail. And they had these big wagons with big wide wheels, and they'd have to hitch horses or oxen on the back of the wagon to hold it back. Sometimes they used a cable snubbed around a tree, and I guess one time they lost one of the wagons, and there's still a great big block of granite down on the hill <coughs> below this road. The wagons are so large with a uh, team of horses on the front, uh, they couldn't turn around here, there wasn't room, so they, what they'd do, they'd bring the wagon up, unhitch the horses and bring them around to the other side, then pick the wagon up with a derrick and turn it around and hitch the horses back on. <laughs> now 
another shot. It's too bad they didn't have one of those wagons loaded with uh, granite on it when we, when this shot was taken. But they uh, <clears throat> could pick up a pretty good sized now, hunk of granite. Who did the lifting? Was it horses or was it human beings pulling something? No, they they would use horses. In fact, uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, Crofter got real interested in how do these derricks operate. So he talked to the, he wrote a letter to the president of Rock of Ages <coughs> quarry up in, you know, Rock of Ages granite business in Barry, and, and they invited us up. Crofter and Harry and I went, went up and they showed how these, the modern versions of these derricks work. Yeah, they, you can't see it here, but the, uh, up on the end of this boom that uh, slants up there, there would be a, a pulley or a cable there hitched over to the top of the vertical boom, and then somewhere down below there'd either be a team of horses or oxen that would provide the, you know, the lifting up and down. Uh, and then down at the bottom, and I, yeah, this there was a way of turning the whole derrick, and the ones up in Barry, uh, at the bottom of those uh, the vertical boom, there was a big wheel. It was called the bull wheel, and they would in the early days they would have a p pair of oxen that was hitched onto a cable around that bully uh, bull wheel that could turn the derrick. Uh, around and because see they would pick up stones where it's shown now and then they could uh, turn the derrick over and let the stone down on a, onto a wagon. I don't know exactly how they turned these but probably similar way. And that little railroad you see they, they got a lot of junk or a lot of slag you know rocks they couldn't use and you can see today there's a big you can see if you look over the edge there's a big uh, slag pile or pile of broken pieces and rock and they they used that little railroad track to take that stuff and take it out to the edge of the bank and dump it over. These, Don, you said those timbers came from where? where? Yeah, um, I forgot where I, I got this information but they said the timbers came from uh, the Carolinas, the north or south. Yeah. And, and they were probably yellow pine. I always wondered where the timbers came from because they're, they're really long, <laughs> very long and straight and so on. Weathersfield Cabin. I don't know exactly where that Tell was. Tell us about the picture before that, what that was. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, oh yeah, I should, oh. yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, workers on the quarry lived up in this bunkhouse you can't see the other side of it, but it's, I think it's pretty narrow. And uh, see, there wasn't much sp space up there at the quarry. And we think this bunkhouse was sort of south of the quarry because if you go to the other side of the quarry, it's just, you know, all rocks and you couldn't have room for a bunkhouse. Is that the, the railroad tracks on the uh, trestle? Uh, just beyond the bunkhouse? Yeah, it looks like it. And I don't, of course, I don't have a picture that it was taken at this same time. They must have had some kind of a, a track thing running out. Maybe they could pick up rocks and <laughs> bring them out on a track. But these, of course, the men had this way. They didn't have to climb up and down the <laughs> half up, uh, halfway up the mountain every day to go to work. <laughs> Weathersfield Cabin. I don't know exactly where that was. Does anybody? <laughs> And evidently it was built by hikers and people from Wethersfield. Now it looks like it had a sheet metal roof. And it looks like I've seen a little better picture. Evidently something <coughs> gave because this is kind of on, a, on an angle. This uh, Hollis Putnam was Hugh Putnam's father. And he was born in 1906, so you can guess what the date of this picture is. He's the boy on the left. Is he 10 years old? Is he 12 years old? <laughs> if 
he's 12 years old, that would be picture taken in 1918. And, and uh, you can see the roof had deteriorated a lot. Looks like the wind took some of it off. And uh, yeah, Ralph Bissell said when he was sometime in this, would be in the 1920s, maybe the middle of the 20s, he spent the night in the, in the uh, stone hut and it rained like everything and he had to get way over in the corner. There was only one place where the roof didn't leak and he still got kind of, his feet got kind of wet, he said. Don, you wondered where that log cabin shelter was. It almost looks as though it was in exactly the same place. You know, if, you, if you look at the, how the yeah. rocks go uphill to the it, left. It looks like it, but I don't think it okay. was. I think the Wethersfield uh, log cabin was farther down, some uh, near where the Wethersfield Trail is. Okay. There's the Rangers cabin, and and that uh, we know where that is because it's on the uh, top part of the trail, uh, where you, where you hike up from the parking lot. There's a sign that says that, where the ranger's cabin was. And uh, Ralph Bissell, when he was a young guy, about probably 12, 13 years old, he, he used to go up and stay with the ranger and help him do his sightings and things. Maybe that's him in the middle, I don't know. <laughs> now, would the ranger have manned the fire tower? Right, that's what the ranger was there for. And they had a one-wire telephone system that went down to the base and so if they spotted a fire somewhere they could call up his headquarters and give him the bearings of where where the fire was. Another shot of the cabin is pretty well built. Here's a logger's cabin. Uh, somebody might know where the where that was or is. Is that the one that's with the little sign on the Windsor Trail? Probably is, yeah. CC Cabin, CC something? There's a lot of logging done on, on the mountain and... Uh, There's a lot of logging done on the mountain, and uh, my father always said that most of the, the loggers that uh, cut logs on Mount Escutney lost their shirt <laughs> because it was such a job to get the logs off, and uh, and so they didn't, and they had a lot of accidents. Uh, they say that the, these, maybe this cabin had it, but the loggers' cabin would have a uh, meat grinder because they lost a lot of oxen in uh, hauling these logs down the mountain. Well, so they might have had ox burgers. What about human accidents? I mean, the, 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 the quarry must have produced some human accidents. It could have. I don't, I don't know. As I, I've never seen any records of that. But yeah, it was dangerous work. Uh, one thing, okay. <laughs> this steam donkey is still there. It's a... Uh, it's near the Futures Trail, and uh, it was what they used. It's kind of hard to see in this picture. You can see the piston, and then it went over to a crankshaft, which drew, drove a, uh, through a pair of gears, drove a, a drum for the uh, cable. And evidently what they did, you see below this, uh, down the slope from this uh, steam donkey, it's very steep. And so they hauled it, they had an overhead cable of some sort, and they hauled the logs up to where they could get at them and take them down the mountain uh, by <coughs> sleds or, or whatever they were using those days. Don, yeah. uh, at Bryant there was a fellow named Mike Matson, Emil Matson. Yeah. He worked logging on Mount Escutney long ago. He's passed on now. But he said he taught uh, 
some of the crew how to make skis and, and they skied all the way into the square in Springfield from the <laughs> logging site. They must have got a pretty good st start. Yeah. <laughs> the last logging operation, maybe some of you remember it, was on the northwest side of the mountain, I think around 19, the late 40s or early 50s. Because I can remember going down the, the road, you know, that goes from uh, 106 down to Brownsville. You could see where they cut very high on the mountain and, and they cut, this was all for pulp wood, and they evidently they cut the trees and then they cut the branches off and they put them in windrows. You could see the windrows. And years ago, I hiked up in that area with Paul Magoon, and we could still see the remnants of those old windmill, uh, wind rows. And down below there, they had a thousand foot uh, flume, or that they could, it was lined with, it was iron or sheet metal, that they could slide the logs down this chute for about a thousand feet. And then down to the bottom, if you go on the west side of the mountain now, up the uh, bison, the bottom of the bicentennial trail, I think takes you up into kind of a level place, and they could they could bring the trucks up to there, and that was where the base of the chute was, and they could load their pulp trucks there. That was the last logging, I guess, on the mountain. Yeah, we have this picture of this scout camp, but nobody can tell me where it is or where it was. It looks like it's under some overhanging rocks. Well, I think it's the witch's house from Hansel yeah. and Gretel. Looks yeah. like it. They were getting the pot of soup ready. <laughs> okay, in 1967 is when the Scutney Trail uh, ATA started, and uh, of course it was it was Herb Ogden Senior, the one that got this going. Uh, Ralph Bissell was the treasurer. Hey, uh, Don, you should mention that Ralph is still alive and he's celebrating his hundredth birthday. Right, I I will, <laughs> and we'll see you'll we'll see a little video of that, <laughs> and of course the other people. Uh, Gus Aldrich, of course, was very active, uh, Herb Ogden, Jr., and uh, somewhere I did see uh, it was a picture that had Robert Ely in it, and I remember Dean Milligan because he, he worked at Combs, and... Uh, and later Bryant. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, and mine is still alive. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, Guilford. Well, I always see them at the Tunbridge Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guilford. Yeah. He has a, a, a mill site with a dam. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the first uh, guidebook uh, that they printed in, printed in 1905 or, or seven. 67. 67, yeah. I'm and the down at the bottom, that, that's their uh, purposes, or, or that's their mission statement. To open and, and maintain hiking trails, to build and maintain, and maintain shelters, to get, gather historical data, personal services, no, stories. personal stories, you can read better than I can. <laughs> What's that last? To hunt our points yeah. of special in yeah. interest yeah. to publish a guidebook. Good. <laughs> so that's the guidebook. Here's Ralph Bissell, and this was at his 100th birthday party. He was sort of glancing off to the side, but you can see he's still in good shape. He has a good loud voice, and we'll hear it a little later. Uh, he was the secretary treasurer, and that's a copy of of the uh, yeah, Herb Ogden Jr.'s, that was a copy of his, his membership, membership uh, tag, and signed by Ralph. He was a shirt sleeve member. He, he, he did work. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, he was. He 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 would, he would work, but he didn't. He wasn't a supporting member. He didn't just give his money. <laughs> okay, nineteen sixty-eight. Uh, that was the second hike up the mountain. I didn't seem to have any pictures from the first one because the the uh, well, that was the <coughs> second picnic or a Scutney day. I always liked this picture because they had awful big feet then. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody mentioned that those are Vietnam, the boots that the boys wore in Vietnam. I thought it was a new fashion. <laughs> yeah. Another picture of the same hike. There's Herb and a group of hikers. Yeah, yeah, I have a copy of that. In the, also in '68, they built the uh, log cabin, that log hut is still, of course, the, up there on the Windsor Trail. And all of the uh, building materials and everything had to, was brought down from the parking lot, and you can see they they made a little, special little dolly that you could load <coughs> roofing onto, and uh, help out in, in bringing it down. He said there was about a, a ton of mortar had to be brought down. Of course, the, uh, the logs were cut right on site because it was made of spruce logs. There was quite, that was quite a project. <laughs> and Herb headed it up, and that's the big fireplace that they built. I guess he's working on it, or has been. That's the finished log hut, as you can see it today. I believe that's Herb Jr., Herb Ogden Jr. on the right. I don't know who the other person is. Of course, there was a nice spring right in front of it. That's where you could always get water, which also gave a problem because the floor of the, the shelter was apt to be kind of wet. And a few years ago, uh, Crofter Cummings and others put a a floor in the building in the hut, so it's much, much better place to stay now. Starting in '68 through the '80s, I don't know just when it ended. We used to have a winter hike, snowshoe hikes, up to the log shelter, and it was aimed at getting teenage boys or kids, boys and girls, out on snowshoes and. This, this picture was taken inside of the shelter, and they, what they what would they would do was uh, cook, have a they make cocoa, coffee, and a pot of soup. So when you went up there, you could you could have some coffee and, and soup. And See how they got worn out? That one guy is asleep already. Isn't probably, yeah. <laughs> they weren't fit then either. I worked on uh, two or three of these. And the last one that we had was kind of a miserable day. It started to rain like everything. <laughs> when we went down, it was kind of iffy, walking down the trail in the, in the slushy uh, and icy uh, snow. In 77, uh, see, by then, the, uh, there'd been so many communication things uh, dishes and so on put on the mountain and it was a, a really an eyesore and of course the AT, ATA we objected and, and through quite a lot of nego negotiation and so on and this is rather abbreviated what was what was done the state of Vermont and the companies involved uh, this equipment was consolidated on one large tower I think it's just one Large tower and one small one. Am I right on that? That's what it says. Yeah, that's what it says. But I, I think there's more up there. It could be. I haven't been there for a while. Uh, you see, that's the original. That's the steel tower that was built, uh, probably in the 30s, about the middle 30s. That was built after the CCs had put the road up there. And see, that was an observation tower. You could get up to the top of it and see around pretty pretty good. I've, I remember 
going up it a few times and much earlier than when these pitches are taken. Yeah, and then another thing happened the base of the Wethersfield Trail, there was a new owner uh, moved there and, and bought the land where the trail went on the west side of the uh, of the Cascade Falls. And so they had to close the trail, the Windsor Tra the Wethersfield Trail in 84, and then later the, the negotiations with the state and other, others, they bought land on the other side of the the brook or the other side of the Cascade Falls and uh, put in a parking lot and now it's all protected so uh, nobody can uh, give us any problems about hiking up th that part of the trail. The, the original steel tower was taken down and they modified it some and shortened it and put it up where it is now on the, on the summit and uh, it's high enough so you can you get you get you over the tree line, but uh, it's high enough so you can see all the way around. A pretty good group of them come up every year at our picnic. That picnic is May 28th. This year. Right. Uh, one thing I f forgot to mention is that back in the around the 1880s and 90s, down at the foot of the uh, Windsor Trail, there was a farm there, Dudley Farm, I guess, and he had uh, some burrows. And you could go over there and rent a burrow and ride up to the top. And then you could let the burrow go, and he'd go back down to the bottom by himself or herself, <laughs> and then the person would walk back. And uh, I don't know just how long it went along, but anyway, my father told me that once when he was a kid, and this would be in the early 1890s, he and his parents and his aunt and the rest of the kids in the family, there were probably four or five of them, they went over and the adults did ride up on the burrows and the kids walked. And he didn't say, uh, <coughs> I don't remember him saying whether, the, uh, the, whether his father and mother and the aunt rode back down on the burrows or whether they let the burrows go and, and they went back to the bottom. <laughs> So I, <clears throat> we got to the end. <laughs>